us this morning. Good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning as we sing God's praise together. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 John chapter 2. For those of you keeping score, we're finishing chapter 2 this week. We're, we're almost to the halfway point of 1 John. As we continue in our series, Reality Check, Confidence and Assurance Through Knowing Jesus. We've been reading through the book of 1 John, which was a letter sent by John to those in the local churches who had experienced false teachers in the Gnostics. They experienced those who had been loved and a part of their Christian community leave because of the world and this false teaching. John is reminding them this morning what is true and what is false, that their salvation is sure, the assurance of their salvation is sure. So how are they to live that out in a world that seems either apathetic toward Jesus or against Jesus? This morning, John will lead us to see how we can hang in there and be found remaining in him. If you are able, please stand in honoring the reading of God's Word. As we read from verse 24 to verse 29, John writes this, What you've heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He Himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you received from Him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, His anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you Remain in Him. So now, little children, remain in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. Let us pray. Father, we come to You this morning as Your people. We've gathered together to sing Your praise. We've gathered together to honor your word, to sit under it. Lord, would you teach us this morning? Would you, through your spirit, make known to us your will, your ways, that we would be found faithful in living in them? Lord, we, we ask that you would be present amongst us, that your presence, your spirit would open our hearts and our minds to your word that we would receive it. God, would you speak through your servant? Would you speak through your word to your people this morning? We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Have you ever had somebody say, come on, just hang in there with me? You know, I'm no, uh, you know, ER was a little bit before my time. And, uh, you know, there's medical dramas on TV, you know, we could list off the, the shows, but we always have seen the scene in the TV show where the, the EMT or the doctor is, they're like on top of the gurney doing CPR, they're rolling beside the gurney, and the doctor usually says something to the effect of, come on, hang in there with me. And, you know, not to be silly, but you're like, what does the person laying in the bed bring to the table in that moment? I mean, seriously, what do they bring to their saving? Nothing, really. The only thing that they bring to the table in that moment is the willingness, the drive, the motivation to stay alive. That's it. That's all they bring to the table. If they have that willingness and motivation to stay alive, the doctors and the EMTs do their work. Now, 
I know that uh, some of us have, uh, in this room have worked in the medical field. I'm saying some of us. I'm saying us. I've never worked in the medical field because that would be terrifying. But I'm sure that that's not completely real life, but I'm just using it as an illustration. I believe it's the same with our spiritual lives. As we talked about last week, God keeps His people as God keeps us and brings us safely to our forever home, we don't really contribute anything to our salvation. We bring our sin-sick selves. God is calling His people, His children, to remain faithful, to hang in there with Him. And as we persevere and endure in the Christian life, we must bring the willingness, the drive, and the motivation to remain faithful to Him. And the good news, church, is that God will do the rest. He will do the rest. The first truth this morning from our word is remaining in the gospel allows us to experience God's presence and promise. Remaining in the gospel allows us to experience God's presence and His promise. John writes he's, that we are to be found remaining in the gospel. What you've heard from the beginning is to remain in you. What have you heard from the beginning of your Christian life? What is the basis of your Christian life? It's the gospel. It's the message of what God has done, what He has accomplished through the life of His Son Jesus, His death, His resurrection, it's the message with calls to put our faith and trust in Jesus for salvation because of what He has done for us. That's why Peter says to the Jewish leaders in Acts 4, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. That's why Paul writes in Romans 1.16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But we don't just accept the message of our salvation. When we hear the gospel, when you became a Christian, we don't just receive the message and think, gee, thanks, great, check the box and move on with our lives. We must remain in that message. We must continue to live in light of that message and the transformation God has worked in our lives. We must remind ourselves of that message every day that God saved us. He has forgiven us. He loves us. He has restored us. We will no longer be condemned because of our sin. When we then live our lives every day in light of these truths. When we continue to do that, reminding ourselves every day of the truth of our identity in Christ, John says we will be experiencing God's presence. He writes, if, you have, if what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and the Father. Your relationship with Christ will be guarded and you will be able to experience continued fellowship with God. That's why following Jesus isn't a religion. It's a relationship. You and I, we don't have a religion with someone. We have a relationship with them. You know them, and they know you. That's how a human relationship, that's how a relationship works. You don't have a religion, someone, and it be healthy. You have a relationship with them. By remaining in the gospel, we can remain in the presence of God and He remains in our lives. 
in relationship because of Jesus. Remaining in the gospel also allows us to experience God's promise by enduring to the end, which is what he talked a little bit about last week. We'll see that God's promise to us, that promise that he himself made to us eternal life. John says in his gospel, That those who believe in Jesus won't perish, but what? They'll have eternal life. Not only do we get to experience His presence in this life, but we will get to be with Him in the next one. And we never have to leave. It's not like we get there. It's like... It's not like a meet and greet with the celebrity where you get to talk to him for two seconds and move on. We get to be with him forever. We don't just live forever in heaven. We don't just escape death and judgment. But by remaining in the gospel and enduring to the end, we get to be with God himself the one who loves us, the one who saved us, and we get to be with Him forever. We get to be with Him as He truly wanted us to be, in His presence without any blemish of sin. John MacArthur writes that if we stay faithful to the truth, we continue to experience intimate communion with God and Christ and persevere to a full, eternal life. We remind ourselves of these truths every day. There's a a pastor that I believe he just recently passed away in the last year or two. His name was Jerry Bridges. And he had this, he didn't come up with the phrase, but man, he sure blew it up, that's for sure. He had this phrase, preach the gospel to yourself every day. You think, but I'm already saved. Why would I preach the gospel to myself? You see, the reason that he believed that we should preach the gospel to ourselves every day is to remind us of who we were, that like like sheep gone astray, we've all gone astray. For there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's you, that's me. But then we remember that For God so loved the world that He sent His only Son so that whoever would believe in Him won't perish but have eternal life. That whoever, that's you, that's me. And we remind ourselves that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Those who confess that Jesus is Lord and they believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead, there is a promise that they will be saved. That's you. That's me. And then, you think about Romans 8.1. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You and I, because we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we never stand condemned. And we remind ourselves of that truth every day. When we remind ourselves of that truth every day, it's refreshing our minds. It's calling our minds and our hearts to remain in the gospel. The gospel is not just something that we say, hey, I accept it, I get baptized, and now I'm going to sit in a pew the rest of my life. No, it's every day. It's everything we have. And if we remain in the gospel John says we get to experience God's presence right now. And that we also get to experience His promise. That He will bring us home. That we will experience eternal life. What a promise that God gives to us. Later on, and we'll read... In a few weeks in 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12, 
John cuts to the chase. He said, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. If you have Him, you have life this morning. Remind yourself of the gospel every day. Remind yourself of who you were and what God has done, and now who you are becoming because you're walking with Him. Our second truth this morning is the Holy Spirit gives us discernment between the deceivers and the truth. John says, I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Who are, who's trying to deceive? Who are the ones trying to deceive? Well, for starters, we know that John is writing in response to the Gnostics. He even goes as far. Last week we heard him call them antichrists. Pretty strong language. Those who reject the true gospel message. But there are those in our world who are trying to sway us, draw us in, and lead us. In our world, even in our American Western culture now, truth has been taught to be relative unless it agrees completely with the world. Then it's okay. There are those in the church who even preach that we can live our best life now and not faithfully enduring and clinging to Christ. There are those in the church who misuse the Scriptures. There are those in the world who would love for us to give ground on what we believe that Scripture teaches. And they try to accomplish this very subtly. They can manipulate and ultimately deceive. The evil one, he was successful in using the teaching of the Gnostics to lead those in the local church that John is writing to to walk away. That the Gnostics would acknowledge Jesus, but they didn't preach the true gospel. And, the, and, and those that followed them left. They departed. And the evil one is still using that strategy today. He didn't shelve it. He's still using it. But the good news for you and for me is we don't have to listen to those voices. We don't have to listen to those voices. John tells us, he tells us about the Spirit's role in teaching us. He says, as for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you. And you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it has taught you, remain in Him. Last week, we talked about the anointing we receive at salvation. That the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. Now, this doesn't mean now that you don't have to listen to anyone who is teaching and preaching the Word of God. John didn't just say, I don't have to listen to my pastor. I'm just saying that for my own selfish benefit. But, because John, what's John doing in this moment? John is writing to them and he's teaching them, right? So it's kind of an, if we were to take that just at face value, it would be, that's kind of an oxymoron, John. But what John is saying is that Anyone teaching and preaching the Word of God must be given a hearing. You are now listening to the Holy Spirit, not just anyone in the world. But John is getting at in this moment is we don't need to be taught anything that is contrary to the Gospel in a way that is to be received and lived out. It's one thing that the, the Scriptures teach us. We are to receive that Word. It says we are to experience the renewing of our minds. To live faithfully. To live fruitfully. 
but the Holy Spirit is the only one. And the Holy Spirit testifies to the Scriptures. So any other voice that commands that we listen to them and it's their way or the highway, that voice is, is not of the Lord. That voice is of the world. So we aren't to receive that message and live it out if it doesn't jive with Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will teach us what is true and what is not. And we will know the truth from the Scriptures because the Spirit testifies to them. And with the Spirit showing us the truth, we must remain in Him. We must remain in living the truth. Spent a lot of time in uh, John MacArthur's commentary this week. He wrote, In response to these deceivers, the task of the genuine believer is to walk in the truth, i.e., persevere in faithfulness and sound doctrine. Think about the Holy Spirit's role in this. The Holy Spirit gives you and I discernment. If we are truly in Christ and the Holy Spirit truly lives in us, the promise is that He will give us discernment. So what is that like? It's kind of like we become human polygraph machines. Now, bear with me. We become human polygraph machines. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and He testifies about Jesus. We will be able to tell what's true or not. The Spirit testifies according to the Scriptures, which is why it's important we stay in the Word. But the Spirit uses all of that like a lie detector test. We can see something, we can hear something, and the Holy Spirit will give us discernment to see what it really is and be able to call it what it is. When we see or hear something that is contrary to the gospel, it's against the gospel, it's really, truly against Jesus, there's like this thing in our mind, in our heart, it'll... Those little things, if you've ever seen a polygraph test, our little antennas, spiritual antennas, will start going crazy. We'll start seeing things where we're like, oh, this don't add up. And that's the Holy Spirit giving us discernment. In his second letter, John writes, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth in keeping with the command we have received from the Father. We're to walk in the truth. And how we do that is by following the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Our third truth this morning is we are called as God's children to remain in Him through righteous living. We're called as God's children to remain in Him through righteous living. John writes, so now little children remain in Him. We are called to be found remaining and abiding in Him. Abiding, that's the same uh, word we get our root word, abode, which is house, live. We are to live our lives in Him. John may be alluding to what he previously wrote in his gospel where Jesus speaks about abiding in Him. In John 8, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed Him, if you continue in My Word, you are My disciples. If you continue in My Word, you are My disciples. And then John 15, remain in Me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. But why? He writes, so now little children remain in him. Now here's the reason. Here's the so what. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We're, remain, we're to remain faithful to Him so that we're to have confidence and not shame. 
We're to remain obedient to His Word, His Spirit, His calling on our lives. And we should live our lives every day in a way that we won't be ashamed of how we lived when Jesus comes back. That we can stand in the presence of Jesus our King in His appearing. And we can stand in confidence because we were faithful. But those who were not faithful to keep sound doctrine, to remain committed to the message of the gospel, to living it out every day, or lived in a way that was regularly disobedient, these are the ones John says will hang their head in shame when Jesus appears. It's kind of like when you were growing up and your parents gave you the task to clean your room. Your mother and I are going out for a little bit. When we get back, your room better be clean. Yes, sir. Now, if you obeyed the task, if you remained faithful to the task of cleaning your room, when your parents arrived, you could stand confidently. Look, I have been faithful to the task. You can stand confidently before them. But what happens if you do not use the time they have given you and you waste it, you squander it, you don't fulfill the calling of cleaning your room and your parents come back? Did you clean your room? No. John says that we are to remain in Him because when Jesus comes back, if we are faithful, we can stand in confidence. Now, that doesn't mean we stand in our own perfection, but we stand in confidence and say, I, I did it. I did my best. And I did it for you, Jesus. But do you and I want to live lives that when Jesus comes back, we just have so much regret? Like, man, I squandered so much time. I squandered so many opportunities that we have to like stand there in front of Him in shame. John not only answers the why to the question, but the how. How do we remain? He says, if you know that He is righteous, you know this well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of Him. If you know that He is righteous and not you, if you know that Jesus alone was righteous and it was by His righteousness that you were saved, those who have trusted in Christ for salvation know this. If you have received the gospel, if you've believed on Jesus for salvation, you know that it's not by your works, it's not by your effort. It ain't you that's going to get you to heaven. It's Jesus. Those who know this fact also, John says, know another thing. Children of God are to live like their Father. If we have been born again, born of the Spirit of God as children of God, then our lives should begin to resemble our Heavenly Father. We should obey Him. With His Spirit inside of us, we should begin to live lives that look like His. And we won't do that perfectly. We won't do that perfectly on this side of heaven. But there will be evidence of change. There will be evidence that the Lord has truly given you a new heart and a new nature. And He gives us those things to be like Him. We are to be Christians originally meant as a derogatory term. Little Jesus is running around everywhere. They just look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, and act like Jesus. What's up with that? They're everywhere. We're to be like Him in His grace, His compassion, His forgiveness, His love, His sacrifice, His faithfulness. And we can go on and on and on. I don't know if y'all have ever had 
conversations with people, if, if you really resemble one parent or not. And it's easy to look at somebody, you know, if you go to a big family gathering of somebody, you're like, oh, that one belongs to that one because I, they look alike. But what's really fun is when you spend time around them and there's not just, you don't just inherit the way you look, but also the way that you behave and you live. Almost like an inherited temperament of children. If you've ever, like, man, that girl, she's just like her, she's fired up, just like her mom all the time. You ever heard that? Or man, he's just, he's laid back, just like his dad. We've, we've had those conversations it ain't because of the way that they look. It's the way that they live. And as believers, as children of God, we are to not only physically, well, we won't physically resemble God, but we can, we can, our character, the way that we live can resemble our Father. We should look like Him. Our lives should show that He is our Father. Peter writes, in 1 Peter chapter 1, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who has called you is holy, you are to be holy in all of your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's his calling on his children. Be holy, be set apart, live like me. So are you a child of God? Has the Father given you a new heart? Does your life resemble His? If you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, you can leave this morning knowing that you are experiencing God's presence and that you will inherit His promise of eternal life. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is not only Lord of the universe, but also Lord over you, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Scripture is clear that you will be saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you are a follower of Christ. But maybe you haven't been as faithful as you should be in discerning between the deceivers and the truth. Maybe there are times that you just don't care about it. Maybe you should take time this morning, this week, to spend time in confession and repentance. Maybe you haven't taken your personal holiness as seriously as you should. I could be guilty of that. That I think, ah, that's not that bad. We, we like to say that, ah, that's not that bad. But maybe there's a, a news station, a Netflix show, a book that we should put down online habits that we need to leave behind. Run to Him. Go to Him so that you can remain in Him so that your life can show that fruit. Church, He is calling us. He says to us, hang in there with me. Remain in me. Hang in there. Church, it's our job. As much as we're so unable compared to Him, our job is to be willing to put it out there and hang in there to give ourselves over to remaining in Him, to abiding in Him, living our lives in Him. Because when we do that, not only is it going to show that we belong to Him, that we're one of His children, but we'll be able to discern between the deceivers and the truth. And man, what sweet promises God has given to His people. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for time together in Your Word. We thank You for how it speaks to us. Lord, we want to be obedient to You. We want to be Your obedient children. We want to stand 
in the presence of Jesus in his return, confident because of our faithfulness. We don't want to stand there in shame because of our failure. And Lord, we know that it's by your spirit, your strength, your doing that you do this, that you accomplish this. What little role of responsibility we have in it, Lord. Would you help us to be faithful, remain faithful? Would you draw us to yourself? If there is one who is wrestling with something that may impact the way that they live, the way that they believe, Lord, would, would you draw them to bring it to you, to lay it at your feet, Lord, that you would heal them, that you would forgive them, that you would restore them. Father, if there's one that here this morning who hasn't given their life to you, Lord, that they would know the salvation, the great salvation you offer them, that it's not just a one-time transaction, but it's, it's a lifetime journey that you promise to walk with them. God, you are so good and so faithful to us. Help us to hang in there and remain with you. Lord, be with us in this moment. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.